Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. Remember the story of the strawberries last week? Well, I had a kind of similar experience this week with shoveling snow. I wanted to try to help out some neighbors, and at the same time, it, it's free exercise. You don't have to pay for gym membership or anything like that. And so I was able to go and take care of a couple of the older neighbors' driveways. And then more snow came, and we took some more shoveling, and more snow came another day, and there's more shoveling. And eventually it came to the point when I closed my eyes, all I could see was more shovelfuls of snow waiting to be thrown this way or that. And we noticed how Abram had to face something sort of like this too. And first, before we look at that again in Genesis 15, we're going to pause briefly for prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for your presence in our lives. Help us from this experience of Abram to take you into our lives in a very special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 15. And we're going to take a look first at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Abram, at this point, he probably, when he closed his eyes, had these searing images of what had happened way up there by Damascus when he and his 300 Hanukkah, the dedicated ones of his household, had gone with his allies, the neighbors, Mamre and so forth, and as they rescued Lot and all these others who had been conquered by the enemy kings, he would have seen things, heard things, smelled things, felt things that would have left terrible images in his mind that he would have to have burned into his mental thought processes for the future. And now to hear from God the promise that, don't worry, I'm with you. It's like that stuff's back there. But that actually wasn't his main worry. He had something else that was seriously causing him grief and causing him concern. But God did promise him two things. He promised, I'm your shield and your reward. I'll protect you. And I'm there for you. I'm there for you in ways that you don't have to worry about if you're acknowledged or recognized for what you did for others. I am your reward. Well, remember, God had promised him two things. He had promised him before this, land and offspring. And so far, there's no child. And so far, there's no piece of land he can call his own. Come with me to verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Abram comes up with all kinds of bright ideas, trying to help God along with keeping the promise about the offspring. Remember the two, he's promised land and offspring. So way back in chapter 12, we have the inferred idea. We see him going out with Lot, his brother's son. And so as he takes his nephew Lot, he's possibly thinking, this could be my offspring. At least it's part of the family. I'll take him. Well, he doesn't come right out and say it, although we notice when we get to chapter 13, that doesn't work out so well for him. In fact, in chapter 13, he has to tell his nephew, look, we have to separate. The land can't bear us all. So then he comes up with bright idea number two, and that's here in this chapter, chapter 15. Come with me to verse 3. Then Abram said, Look, you've given me no offspring, and indeed one born in my house is my heir. There you have it. Don't have to worry about the fact that my wife and I are too old for children. I'll take and adopt my servant. In fact, we know his most trusted servant, Eliezer, and in fact, down later in chapter 17, he's going to mention him by name. 
And the people in that area had the practice when they were childless of sometimes adopting the most trusted servant to become the heir of the household. Well, notice what the Lord says to him about this in verse 4. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. There you have it. He's not able to take his nephew to be the substitute. He's not able to take a servant to be the substitute. Well, later we see in the next chapter, he's going to come up with yet another bright idea, so to speak. And that is, well, how about if, actually, he didn't come up with that idea. His wife came up with the idea. And that is, how about if I take her special servant from Egypt, Hagar, and let her be a surrogate mother and... Hagar and I will have a child that will become the child of promise. But we will see again, the Lord will specifically tell him, no, it isn't going to be that one. It's one from your own body. Well, right now, we see that the second bright idea in verse 4 was not accepted. So come with me to verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. Count the stars. Come outside. This shows us it's nighttime. And as we go into the chapter some more, we'll see that he's out during the day and the sun will eventually set. And so this is a process that's going through some time, through the starting in the darkness and then into the daylight and on into the night that follows. And God is inviting him to connect in a different way. But notice what that all in involves. You have no descendants, but look, just like you can't count the stars, people won't be able to count your descendants. Instead of telling him how, God merely says, it's going to happen. He keeps reiterating, this is my promise. It will happen. Trust me. Come with me now to verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed. This passage here becomes a very key passage for later writers, including the Apostle Paul. He especially came back to quote this again and again in the letters that he wrote to other people. And he focused on a special couple of realities. Come with me in your Bible back across to the book of Galatians, the little letter he wrote to Galatians, chapter 3, verse 6. Just as Abram believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, verse 7, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So there you have it. He's noticing that this was a statement of faith and we can have the same kind of faith, saving faith, that Abraham had. In fact, he gives a whole lot more information about how this works in a letter that he wrote probably quite some time later as he wrote to the Romans. Come with me to Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? Verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So there you have it. He notices, that is Paul, notices that this is something that God did for Abraham way back when he had no children. And if it's all about human works, Abraham could just go out and do his thing and there would be a child coming, but he wasn't able to generate offspring. He needed the power of God. And so... This is happening to reveal, as Paul points out, it isn't just that you can make it happen by your own stress and effort and energy. No, there needs to be faith, and God brings this to happen. Let's continue taking a little bit of a look at verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Drop down to verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abram for righteousness. There it is, because 
it was written by Moses so many centuries earlier that he believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now Paul says, see, it was his belief, not his action. Yes, actions are important, and Paul will get into that deeper in his letter here in chapter 4. But let's continue on with the next verse. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And we know, of course, that that doesn't come until a couple chapters later in Genesis 17. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So there we have it, in a nutshell. Before Abraham entered into circumcision, which would be one of the signs of those who would be faithful to the covenant and would be known as the people of Israel, Anyhow, before that happened, already there's belief and there's righteousness credited to him. Actions follow, but it starts with belief, and God says, okay, because of your faith, I count you as righteous. Now, there's a lot more information that Paul gets into how that righteousness is not ours. It's given to us because it's a gift from Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life, and he gives his perfect life to us as the gift when we reach out and claim it by faith, just like Abram did. Come back, uh, come with me back to chapter 15 of Genesis. We had just read verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness, verse 7. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Does that remind you of anything? It sounds very much like the way God starts the Ten Commandments years later as you hear him say, I am the Lord who brought you out of the house of bondage, you know, as you come into the beginning of Exodus 20. But now he says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of the land of Ur. And this begins to be a little bit of a trigger for us to see a pattern of how the Canaanites made very special promises, the very intense promises that we would call covenant. In fact, back in those days, covenants were usually unequal agreements between parties. And on the one side, you have the big powerful guy that's defeated everybody else, and he's called a suzerain. And on the other side, you have the one that got defeated, and there are many others like him, and this lower one is called a vassal. So in between the suzerain and the vassal, there are these agreements that cannot be broken. They're very clearly laying out what needs to happen. And they start with the suzerain telling, this is what I did for you. And then it moves on down the line to, okay, what do I expect from you? But they didn't just make these as comments. They would take animals and they would cut them in half and put the pieces a bit apart from each other. And then the vassal, the one who has to follow all the stuff, pay the taxes, whatever the suzerain demanded, the vassal would walk in between these pieces showing, okay, I am going to keep this special commitment, this promise, this covenant. I'm going to keep it. And if I don't keep it, I understand I'm going to be like these animals. It actually sounds pretty familiar as you continue reading this chapter. Come with me to the next verse. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Verse 9. So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Does that sound familiar? It sounds very much like the Canaanite agreements, the Canaanite covenants. And they would cut those animals and put the pieces apart, and the vassal would walk in between. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that Abram walked in between, but we can be pretty sure that he would have, because he would recognize, oh yes, this is just like the neighbors would do when they make a special covenant. And they would have the vassal walk in between them. So probably he walked in between, and we noticed that things got a little problematic. It's, it isn't nighttime anymore. He's not out there seeing stars and so forth. In fact, he sees something more difficult than that. Come with me to the next verse. 
And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. When I look at that in my Hebrew Bible, that deep sleep is a taradama, and I think, oh, that sounds familiar, because taradama is the word, the same word that Moses used way back in chapter 2 when Adam fell into this taradama, this deep sleep, because God put him into that sleep so God could do surgery, taking out one rib and building a woman from it. But this time, there's something different between what happened to Adam and what happened to Abram. Each of them fell into the deep sleep, but what's the extra thing that Abram had to face? Verse 12, after it said, the deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Adam didn't have to face that horror and great darkness. Yes, darkness came eventually as Adam experienced night and day and sunrise and sunset, but this was a horrible, chilling kind of feeling of foreboding that came upon Abram. And in the middle of that challenging peace, God was preparing him emotionally to see what's going to follow many years later. Come with me to the next verse. Then he, that is God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they will come out with great possessions. That wasn't the kind of news Abram would want to hear. That's difficult, discouraging, unpleasant, but it's good to know in advance. And as he could look way down into the future, it showed God's love in a different kind of way. This is what your people will face. They can know about it in advance. They don't have to be caught unprepared. But it's also kind of a picture of what people would face beyond the people of Israel. In fact, while they would have a specific amount of time, the 400 years of this mess going on, these things would happen again and again through history as God's people would be oppressed by those who did not believe like they did, who did not care about the Lord that they served or followed. People would oppress God's people. Uh, others outside of God's realm would oppress God's people. But the good news is God steps in at some point in history, just like he did with the Egyptians, and he punished them for what they had done. Now, some of you are taking time to see similar things that Isaiah predicted many years later as Assyrians would come in and deal with the northern kingdom and later Babylonians would come and deal with the southern kingdom and in each case God mentioned yes they're coming in as a punishment for what went wrong with my people but I will also judge those nations that punish you because they've got their own problems and Isaiah tells some very specific details of that but here all the Lord reveals, as you look down again with me here at verse 13 and 14, we see verse 13, God's people would be afflicted and have to serve. Also, verse 14, the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. So God is fair. God will deal with this. It doesn't look fair. For years, the Jews could look up and see the oppressors, the Egyptians, and think, why would you let them do this to us? We are your people. But the day was coming when God would set this straight. He would make it right. And his own people would go out with great riches that would be given to them by these same oppressors. Verse 15, Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Well, I don't know how encouraging that is or isn't. At this point, Abram still is in his 90s, and he's going to live to be 175. So yes, that's a good old age. And perhaps the day would come that he'd feel, yes, I've been, been around long enough. But he was shown, you won't have to face this stuff. It will happen much later to your descendants. But notice what God says next. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That's intriguing. Two things are highlighted here. We see that God's people will come out after a few centuries go by, and we see that 
the neighbors around here that are bad, their iniquity is not complete. Translating the word shalem, which is like shalom, peace. It's often used with a sense of peace and sometimes used with the idea of complete, like it's not done yet. And God recognized, there's no reason for me to send people to push back these godless ones because they're still not so bad yet to where it is right for them to be removed forcibly. That would be centuries later. But for the time being, also, secondly, God's people would need time to multiply, to be enough to actually be able to do what God would send them to do. So centuries would go by, four centuries, also called four generations, which we're not going to get into right now. I'm not going to take time to try to explain the nitty-gritty details, but it likely is a look at the four generations are the time actually in Egypt. And yes, things are dicey for the 400 years, but about half of that is the actual in Egypt time. Anyway, come with me to the next verse. And it came to pass, when the sun went down, and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. That is really unexpected. These are images, you know, the, what does it say here? The smoking oven and burning torch that passed between? These are images that are usually used for God. He is a consuming fire. He, his presence is. We see him in the pillar of fire at night when Israel came out of Egypt. And we see time and again God reveals himself in a flaming fire. But now the flaming fire goes between the pieces, the pieces of animals. Yes, the vassal is supposed to go between the pieces, but the suzerain? God would be the greater one in this equation, Abram would be the lesser one. So strangely, as Abraham saw this, well, at that time called Abram, he would be thinking, wait a minute, I knew I was supposed to do that, but God is going in between? Two things kind of interesting that Moses noted. One, that Abram's faith was credited to him as righteousness. And now the second one, we see that God himself goes through just like a vassal would do, but he's the suzerain. It isn't, even though it's an unequal relationship, it isn't all like, look, I tell you what to do, but God himself is volunteering. I will hold myself accountable. You don't have to hold me accountable. I hold myself accountable to this covenant. Now you notice what it says next, verse 18, on the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I want to pause for a moment. He made a covenant. There are different verbs used. So, for example, in Genesis 9, he establishes a covenant, you know, from the verb kum in Hebrew. When you jump down to chapter 17, you see a simple term, he made a covenant, not on, you know, like to give or make. And here in chapter 15, in verse 18, it's the normal word that the neighbors would use for making a covenant. It's karat berit. Karat is to cut. Berit, covenant. So he would cut a covenant. And that doesn't sound like anything we would say in English. But it makes sense when you think of how the Canaanites did it. They cut the animals, spread the body parts apart, and then the vassal would walk between them. So they literally and figuratively cut a covenant. So here it uses the normal terminology just like the neighbors would have used that the Lord God cut a covenant with his person Abram. Come with me to verse 18 the second part. This covenant is to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. He names these nations that are going to follow. And did you look at how many there were again? Look back there at the text real quick. Did you see how many? There were 10. There are more neighbors than that, but Moses chose to name 10. And it's one of the numbers that shows a kind of completion when you're in the Old Testament, 10. And so you'll see 
10 of these nations that are around that are going to be displaced, showing this place is going to be entirely yours. This land will be your land. Well, not yet. At this point, it's still Abram moving around as a nomad in tents, no offspring, and all God does is say, it's coming, it will come to you. And so we realize there are times in life when God makes promises that we get to enjoy right now. But he also makes promises that are for later. And just because the time is delayed doesn't mean God broke his promise. It just means we have to wait. Just like Abram waited for land and children, sometimes we have to wait. So here we have it. Genesis 15 can be a chapter that can be tempting to kind of skip over quickly and we feel like, why would we want to read about all this weird covenant kind of stuff like what the neighbors did? But pause and think about some of the main points in here. Back in verse 6 where Abram believed and it was counted as righteousness. Wouldn't you like that in your life? Paul told the Galatians, he told the Romans, and through the process asked for this to go to the rest of us for all time, saying that we are descendants of Abram. In fact, Galatians 3 had made that very clear at the end of it, that if we belong to Christ, we're Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. But as a child of Abraham by faith, when you claim by faith the promise, it's yours. It is credited to you as righteousness. Jesus' righteousness is yours as a gift. What a blessing. But there's more than that. Just like Abram would have to wait and his descendants would go through some bad stuff. We have to wait. Jesus promised us land and descendants, so to speak. We get the land of heaven. Jesus promised, for example, in John 14, how he's going to prepare a place for us. And it's going to be so much more awesome than the place that was promised to Abram. So he's promised us land and descendants. It isn't necessarily the same, but the descendants that we have are not only the children that God may bless our homes with, but are the people that we get to bring to the kingdom. God doesn't only bring Abram into the land, he brings others with him, and we can bring people with us into God's kingdom when that time comes. Wouldn't you like that to be you? I would. I'd like to be one of the children of the blessing, one of the ones that claims the promise and receives the righteousness of Christ by faith, just like Abram did, even though Christ had not yet been born on this earth. By faith, Abram claimed that promise. Think about it like this. Would you rather imagine that you're going to write an exam and as you're there in the classroom, you look at it and you can't remember half the stuff that's on the page. And then when it's all done, the teacher looks at you and says, okay, I'll give you two choices. You can accept the score you got or I already wrote this exam and you can accept the score I have. Well, that wouldn't be fair in a classroom environment. And indeed, people may think sometimes that the Lord isn't fair, but actually God is more than fair because he doesn't make it fake. When we accept by faith his results, over time he begins to make his results become our results. What a blessing that is. Let's claim that in prayer just now. Lord God, thank you so much for being with us as we go through our journeys. Help us, like Abram, to claim the righteousness of Christ by faith. Thank you for fulfilling that promise for us and for the promise that we get to live with you in a much better place than Abram ever dreamed of. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you continue mining the word and living for him.